Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This, um, this is the first week of a six-week study. We'll be covering the time period of church history roughly from the Crusades to, um, the Crusades to, um, let's see, make the phone quiet, good. Um, roughly from the Crusades through the Reformation. So that's approximately approximately the year 1000 through the 16th century. Now, you'll see, uh, I'm talking about this, and here's the first time. All times are approximate. The scholarship on these issues is in fact in flux, which is, which is a good thing in my mind. Most good scholarship is in flux. What I mean by that is most good scholarship is not satisfied with itself. Just when you think you know everything you should know about something, that's when you hang it up in your pocket. Good scholarship is constantly being examined itself. So, uh, for, for example, if you start Googling this, doing fact checking, what you're going to discover is that sometimes one site will tell you, say, something began in 1054. Others may say, well, actually, it was 1052 because of this. So that's the first disclaimer. All times are approximate. Um, having said that, what I want to do is just begin with a quick word of prayer, and then we'll get into our study. That's okay. Gracious, loving Father, whose mercies are new to us each and every morning, Father, we give you thanks and praise for this time that you allow us. We thank you for the blessings that you pour into our lives. We thank you for your know, guiding hand that has led your faithful children throughout the ages. Lord, as we endeavor to, 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 to study our own past, Lord, we ask that by your Spirit this might be more than simply a time of recollection, but may actually be useful to us even as you guide us in our Christian lives and our Christian walk in the day. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, I'm starting with I'm starting with the Crusades, um, and I'll actually give a little bit of background information prior to that. But but just just to begin, what's a crusade? A crusade. What do you think? You know, what, what is a crusade? Holy war. Holy war. Holy war. Everyone more or less agree with that? Crusade is a uh, holy war. Because no, this is disagreed. What are those who can say that? Cause. 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 Okay. What's that, sir? The cause of the moral component. Ah, cause of the moral component. Excellent. Okay. All right. Um, well, let's talk about that a little bit. The term, the term crusade, uh, by the way, it's kind of a uh, very well done, decidedly gory picture of uh, a typical crusade. See, the term crusade is a matter of uh, entirely modern origin. In fact, uh, crusaders never referred to themselves as such. The term crusade really may come as late as the 17th century. Um, crusade comes from the, uh, the word cross, a cross, as in the cross of a matter. Uh, people who were who had decided they were going to go on a crusade were very much considered to be pilgrims. They were armed pilgrims. And once they decided to go on a crusade, they were given a cross, a cross to be sewn in their clothing. Might have looked like that, that as you might know as a Jerusalem cross. It's, it's debatable what kind of what kind of cross the common man has so much clothing. Artistically, we all think of uh, crusader shields that look a lot like that. Um, much like religious pilgrims, each person who went on the parade swore a, uh, a votus or a, a vow that was to be fulfilled upon successfully reaching Jerusalem. Uh, and that could be anything as simple as, uh, Lord, if you, if you would enable me to get to Jerusalem, 
I will fast for 10 days straight. Or, Lord, if you help me to get to Jerusalem, I, I, I promise that I will give half of everything I possess to those less fortunate than myself. They fulfilled a vow, much as pilgrims fulfilled vows on, on their trips. Um, historians they typically tell us there were anywhere from seven to nine crusades. How's that for a process? <laughs> Somewhere between seven and nine, and some like to split the difference and make it eight. And the reason, as you'll see presently, is that as the crusade era progresses, things become more and more confused. It becomes more and more difficult to actually say, well, this crusade began here and ended here. And in fact, some of the later crusades involved multiple campaigns. And had, as um, you'll see, also multiple motivations. Uh, we are talking about a time period of 1054. That's what historians right now give as the day of the beginning of the crusades, 1054 to 1291. But again, especially as touching that last day, including dates, don't don't engrave anything. If, if you love this class so much. Please do not get engraved in your arm. Crusades ended in 1291. Don't get a tattoo because you'll have to change it by week six. Yes, sir. It is. It is being recorded right now. Even as we speak, it's being recorded by that damn computer. So don't say anything you don't want to serve. Very, very, very. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, we're going to see how we're going to see how this works. I think the audio quality will actually be a little bit better. That was one of the issues we had. Was great pictures, lousy audio the last couple of times, and, and, and honestly, a great picture of me talking, yeah, limited value. <laughs> um, so just to give us an idea of what else has happened before we even get into the purpose of these crusades, talk about a little bit about what else is happening here. Uh, current events in church history. 1053. 1053, the first step, the first real solid political step is taken that leads to what we call the great system. That would be the schism between anyone? Uh, the east and the west. And the west and the east. Rome and Constantinople. The first step is taken. Now, the bishop of Constantinople uh, basically in retaliation to the growing power of Rome orders all the Latin speaking churches in his sphere of influence closed. Bishop Constantinople says, okay, if you can't speak Greek like a proper church, or at least something else in that language they speak over there in Rome, you can't worship. So he closes all of these churches. And in 1054, Papal Legate travels to Constantinople, uh, mostly to tell the Bishop of Constantinople he cannot be called the Ecumenical Patriarch. You can't be an Ecumenical What is an Ecumenical Patriarch? What is Ecumenical? Bishop Constantinople, why don't we get to have a little fun around? Why are they so important? I mean, after all, the so called Pope, he's just one more bishop. Is, is he not? And why does he have all this authority, especially when they are thousands of miles away from us, they speak a different language, and by the way, they even have a slightly different theology in certain areas? Why should he be the boss of us? So Patriarch Michael says, I've had enough. I don't want to be a pope too. Because if he comes up with a more impressive title, Ecumenical Patriarch. In other words, I'm the father. I'm the daddy of all these other churches, regardless, regardless of what their theology may be, I'm the one who's in charge. And the Pope sends a delegation saying, 
No, Michael, you can't have that title for yourself. Well, the end result of this is that Patriarch Michael excommunicates the papal, the papal legate. And the papal legate excommunicates Michael. Now, church law, by the way, has it that that excommunication was transferred to everybody else. So often when people talk about this, up until fairly recent times, again, this scholarship is in flux, up until fairly recent times, the popes considered all Eastern Orthodox people to be excommunicated. And the patriarchs and metropolitans considered all people who were under the pope to be excommunicated. Now, in more recent years, particularly since Diet II, they've begun to actually become scholars, not that there were before they admitted to it. And, and as you know, actually, that excommunication really was only a very small group of people. Well, that's another class, but um, uh, suffice it to say that this is, this is really the beginning of the end of the unity between the East and the West. Mutual excommunication. By the way, there are um, uh, precursors. Yes, ma'am? I was wondering if you would define for me when you say East and West. <laughs> sure, okay. So, West is that part of the church that is under the authority of the Holy See of Rome. So that would be uh, the, the Roman world, the immediate Roman world, we think of it as Italy, as well as the rest of Northern Europe, at least most of it. Now the East is what we think of as, um, well, for example, uh, today Eastern Europe, much of Eastern Europe, portions of Asia, um, what we would eventually think of as Russia. Those are all parts of the East, Eastern and Western. So East is ro ruled by Constantinople, West is ruled by Rome. Does that, does that help a little bit? Okay, good. So is, is this the origin of the Greek Orthodox Church then, the result of the schism? Well, that's a great question, actually. And the reason I'm chuckling to myself is because I guess it was a manual. The manual kind of first said the perception is the reality, right? I'm sure I've said it before, him, but uh, he's, he's famous, so he gets credit. Um, perception is reality. So if you ask a conservative Roman Catholic, they will tell you those Eastern guys broke away from us. They broke away from us. They didn't want our Pope anymore, they broke away from us. And, uh, on the other hand, you ask almost any Orthodox priest, he will tell you, no, no. Where are the original Christians? We have an original creed in its original form. We have an original doctrine. Our worship hasn't changed appreciably since the beginning of Christendom. Or so they tell you. It's Rome. It's Rome that started to do these weird things. It's, it's, it's Rome that turns away. Much as up until fairly recently, a conservative Roman Catholic, if you ask them about, oh, say, Anglicans, or dare I say, Lutherans, uh, they would tell you that, well, those people are all excommunicated because they broke away from us. We were just trying to do our job. We were just trying to work it all out. Then came along these crazy guys like Calvin and Swindley and what's his name? Martin. Um, and uh, they broke away. It's not our fault. Meanwhile, up until relatively recently, if you ask a loyal Lutheran, maybe it was Constance, it not so much Missouri, they might tell you the Pope is the Antichrist. They're all wrong. The perspective. So, um, to answer the question a little more succinctly, no, it's not actually the beginning of the Orthodox Church. It's simply that it began a delineation between East and West. Uh, orthodox, by the way, means what? What is orthodox? Yeah, I have to put a definition. Is that any? Orthodox uh, actually means what? The same, the same belief, the same statement, the same way of thinking. Ortho meaning 
same. Ortho proxy is the same practice. Orthodoxy is the same belief. Uh, now, what is, what, is, uh, what is Catholic, by the way? Thank you. Okay. So, so talk about the ego. Talk about the ego. We have on one side a church that says, we are the universal church. We're the all in all. We're everything. Universal, the beginning part of that word means what? It means one. Just one. There's one church. I mean, we say that in the creed. Now, in the Lutheran church, we changed our word to, to Christian because for a while we were so offended by Catholic. One holy, what? Yeah. One holy Christian not the church? You know, you know, you, you, Roman Catholics come here to visit the church. What? One holy Catholic and not the church. And by the way, most of the rest of Protestantism uses the term one holy Catholic and apostolic church because they're not offended by it the Lutherans are. Yeah, yeah, so we'll see. You get a translated, one universal church. On the other hand, you have a church that says, hey, hey, we're, we're, we're the ones who have the right beliefs. We're the ones who all believe the same things, the correct thing, unlike those other that's East and West. Um, we can probably find precursors of the schism, by the way. We're going all the way back to Kirko 1 e Very early in the game. There are already beginnings of this uh, schism. Uh, by the 4th century, we have major political rivalries between East and West. By the 8th century, we have an interesting controversy that really is the first, if not the first nail in the coffin, at least the first opening of the coffin. The, the creed. Yeah. I see in the creed, for example. Where does the Holy Spirit proceed from? Thank you. Well, actually, so you said. So you say because you were probably born in the United States or in Europe somewhere, and, and, and therefore, you were in the creed, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. But the Orthodox Church leaves out that little clause. Do the okay clause. Proceeding from, from the Son. From the Son. They leave it out. Say, no, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. I mean, there are very good theological reasons for it, by the way. Even the biblical reasons for it. And by the way, about perspective, they would not say they leave it out. They would say to people in the West, and. So, that's. Um, oh, and by the way, 9th century, well, the 9th century, kind of only information. 9th century, that's probably where the primacy issues really kick into high gear. Primacy meaning. Who's number one? Who's the big guy? Who's the judge? Um, Rome, of course, as well. Of course, it's the bishop of Rome. Whereas other sees farther away say, really? Why? Why would you do it that way? So that's, now, um, end of the 11th century, outside of the church, per se, Western Europe has just come out of something. Something, well, very dark. It is really just crawling, maybe, maybe scraping to the nail, its way out of the darkness. That, that wasn't the case in, in the Middle East. That wasn't the case in Northern Africa. That wasn't even the case in far eastern Europe or the Mediterranean. They had civilizations that were beginning to flourish. The West was just humbling. But by the 11th century, they're beginning to emerge as, as, as something with a significant power, although they're still behind the Zambian. That's, that's the East, by the way. Eastern Empire. They're still behind the Byzantine Empire. And by the way, they are also behind the Islamic Empire. 
their pharmacist page for the muscle mortgage. Um, however, something else is happening here. The power is shifted. Some of this may sound eerily familiar to you. Even though Byzantium, that's the east, Byzantium is very powerful, they are beginning to lose ground. Literally, they're beginning to lose ground. Beginning to lose territory to the Muslim world. Uh, specifically to, to the Turks. Uh, just to give you an idea, so you can find this. Um, okay. This should be an open source and animated map. Um, I'll show it a couple of times. Here's what's happening. I don't know if you can see that. See that? The, uh, the pink areas, that's Byzantium. That's the Eastern Empire. Constantinople's right up there in the corner. You see what's happening? Borders are shifting. Back and forth. In general, the trajectory seems to be shrinking. Eastern Christianity, or at least the governments that support Eastern Christianity, are beginning to lose sway. Whereas, by and large, the Muslim world, particularly the Turkish world, is beginning to gain sway. So, what, what, what happens? Um, and I, if you look at your notes, I quote on page two, I quote this next part, uh, east and west, temporarily together again, or uh, the common enemy syndrome. What did they say about the common enemy? Or the, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the, like, I, I guess it's one of those things people say is, you know, well, you know that verse in the Bible that says, kind of like the one about, you know, God helps those who help themselves. Um, real quick story about that. There are a lot of things people think are in the Bible or not. They're part of the common culture. I'm uh, sitting in an office uh, and I'm sort of talking to, um, to a, a couple about their mom's funeral. Their mom just passed away. And she passed away at a good old age. It wasn't unexpected. But hey, it's never a good time to lose anybody. We all know that. We're going to talk about it right now. Never a good time to lose anybody. So I'm, I'm sitting there and uh, the pastor's there. It wasn't Mr. Brindley. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's kind of throwing out different Bible verses that they could use for this funeral service. And, um, and then uh, the lady whose mother passed away didn't like any of them. So the pastor looks over at me, and I take a shot at it. So I'm throwing out different Bible verses uh, that they can use at the funeral. And uh, um, just like in those items. So I looked over the pastor, and the pastor looks over to me, and we kind of got through our list of top 25 funeral ladder verses. Well, the pastor very gently asked, well, oh, oh, dear, what would you like? What would you like for your mom's funeral? And he said, well, you, you know that verse in the Bible? That verse in the Bible that says that, uh, you know, because God couldn't be everywhere, he created mothers? <laughs> 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 the pastor looks over to me, kind of hiding his face behind the bulletin, the smirk on his face, almost as if he's daring, daring me. You laugh first. <laughs> I look back over there, kind of like this. No, you laugh first. You're the one who gets the big bucks. I will, t I will tell you who it was as the first one who finally cracked and said it. Sorry, ma'am. That, that verse is actually from the book of Hallmark. <laughs> and, and there are lots of things in the Bible. East and West. Common enemy. The friend. The enemy of, the enemy of my enemy of my friend. Or at least so it was. Remember, all this stuff is going on between East and West. They just excommunicated each other. Now all of a sudden, well, what can I tell you? Maybe it's true. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. 
All of a sudden, there's real property at stake. Land, money, treasuries. So in 1095, Emperor Alexius sends an envoy to Pope Urban II. Pope Urban II, that is. Um, Pope Urban II and asks for some mercenary troops. Kind of an interesting thing to ask a priest for. I need some mercenaries. Father, send me some mercenaries. Your Holiness, I need some black ops people. Send me some mercenaries so we can do something about this. I need your help to confront the Turkish threat. Interestingly enough, well, the relationship between the East and the West was highly strained. There you go. They came through. 1095, Pope calls on Western Christians. 1095, so here's where it begins. Pope calls on Western Christians to take up arms in order to aid their excommunicated brethren in Byzantium. And what's interesting about that, well, you know, maybe you really are the children of pain. Maybe you are. Because it seems we all love a good fight. This was met with a tremendous response. Well, an enormous response. Two kinds of people. Two kinds of people hated this call. Remember, this kind of the lower military elite. Not, not so much the top brass, but you know, not the not the colonels and generals, but you know, but maybe the non-coms and the first lieutenants and you know, those kind of folks. They created a whole new order of knighthood to respond to this. The other group responded. Everyday person. Our everyday person. Now, I have a theory on this. It's a theory you might not like. See, if you were an average everyday person living in the 11th century, you were not born in the land of gentry. If you didn't have a title, if your great great grandfather hadn't done a big favor for someone else who was important and therefore been granted some other boom, you for the most part had one option. You were a serf, a peasant. A significant portion of the population of the West, Europe, is serfs. You know what that means? Uh, well, effectively, it, it means that you're born in a plot of land. It means that you work there all your life. And you'll die there, too. You may never believe it. That's uh, the basis of feudalism, by the way. Let's say, for example, that Peggy is, uh, is, is a landowner. Uh, Peggy is, say, for example, a, a countess. And, and everybody else here? You're her vassals. You're her serfs. You, you know what? You don't go anywhere unless Peggy says so. She says, jump. You ask how high. And that was how it was. Now all of a sudden, a higher authority comes along and says, hey, you common man. Common man who probably can't read. Common man who probably can't write. A common man who speaks a peculiar little version of Latin that maybe has an 800 or 900 word vocabulary in its entirety. We got an option for you. How do you like to be a soldier of the Lord? Say what? Well, sir. Yeah. We need you to go to Jerusalem and fight off the enemies of God. Fight off those evil people who are taking away all of that. Defending it, doing terrible things, worshiping other gods. Fighting an uncertain war that they did not understand is most likely a preferable option for remaining tied to them. 
currying favor with the same God that seems to have put them in this place of servitude. You see, what a pretty nice option in some ways. Now, I'll just let you mull that over because it's not my place here to preach at you. I may occasion, but it's not in my place. Uh, the other thing I'll just say about that, while I'm on a roll, getting everyone angry at me, um, <clears throat> wars. You'll please notice that it's not, for the most part, the top levels of anything to go on and do this. It's the moral level, officers, and the people who are dirt poor, the people who know nothing. Some of whom are still adolescents. There's all of them completely uneducated. And by the way, utterly untrained, no way, shape, or form, compared to soldiers. That's crusades. Um, we'll just go ahead and, 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 and stop here for a second. I want to um something else and uh, just talk about this a little bit from the Muslim perspective, from the Islamic perspective. I haven't mentioned it, maybe I should have. I now understand the idea that the Crusades, at least what's given as the official reason, the first crusade, is why. You know, free, free Jerusalem from heathen influence and rule. We want the Holy Land back. Well, that kind of begs the question. Beyond the fact that all human beings seem to be obsessed with only land, why is the Holy Land so important for Muslims? It is. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. It, it, absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's a place of prophetic vision for the founder of the third Abrahamic religion. Um, what else? Any other reasons? It's moved to heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, here specific, specifically. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, Islamic tradition, Islamic tradition holds that previous prophets, remember, Islam comes out of, Islam in many ways comes out of the Christian tradition. So, previous prophets were associated with the city. In some ways, they would say, hey, our prophets, and their prophets too. They also hold that Muhammad, as you just said, went out, visited the city on something called his night journey. Muhammad's night journey. Um, the story goes kind of the story goes kind of like this. Um, on a single night, on a single night, Muhammad is believed to have been taken by Barak, the uh, president. Mysterious, mystical force that flew him there. Single night. From there he flies to heaven. He visits heaven. He meets among others Jesus, Abraham, Moses. And that's that's one of their founding myths. Probably holds the same importance for uh, for Muslims as the ascension. Remember the story of the Ascension? Jesus, on the Mount of Ascension, meets home. Previous prophets of Judaism, Moses and Elijah, the law of prophets, symbolically speaking. Um, so, they don't mention uh, Isaac or Jacob. Well, you know, we need that kind of thing. You ever get my original notes of these things before I tear them down? Like a book, okay. But um, but yeah, we can, we, can, we can talk a little bit about that. I, I didn't want to the whole derivation of, 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 of Islam necessarily because it gets controversial to be on the scope. But um, but yeah, they definitely will hold Isaac and Jacob, and uh, particularly Ishmael as, as important characters. Um, much as we will talk about Abraham as being our spiritual uh, forebearer. For example, Paul talks quite a bit about Abraham, does he not? Um, so, just a little further information, by the way, page four, if you're curious, um, since uh, Islam figures heavily in the news these days, uh, five pillars of Islam, five pillars of Islam, 
first, some of this should sound familiar to you, to declare there's only one God. Declare there's only one God. Um, I think so. I think so. Um, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Clear. That's what it was easy to access. Oh, that's Yes. Sorry. Right. Okay. All right. So, five pillars of Islam. First, there's only one God. Um, second one. Pray five times a day. Anyway, not all that differs. Not all that different from rituals followed by Orthodox Jews. Um, fascinating experience. I'm, I'm working as a master technician in the you know, kennel factory. The guy comes in and runs by a kennel. A big kennel, an expensive kennel. We didn't know what the was on it for a while. I don't know if this happens in the Orthodox Jewish guy. It's about 10 to 12 when he first comes in. We're talking. First, we're talking about the technical stuff. Then we're talking <coughs> business. Starts all turning. He asks, I don't know what time it is. I look at my watch. I say, it's about a minute or 12. He said, can you excuse me for a moment? All he goes in the corner. It's a prayer. No, sir. Audibly. About seven minutes later, it comes back, and we're right back to the being transactional. I don't know how I feel about that. I seem to remember Jesus saying something about not praying in the marketplace to start with the seal. On the other hand, there's a fellow who interrupts his business to go and pray. As opposed to a person who interrupts his prayers, you go and transact business. So, second pillar of Islam, ritual prayer. Um, third pillar of Islam, giving two and a half percent of one's savings to the poor and needy. Now, does anybody here parsimonious? Truly parsimonious? I can feel it calculate. Let me see, is the first you are supposed to do? 10%, and if you really actually derive it biblically, that so called tithe, I'm going to actually work out more like 17%, interesting number than 17%. Um, well, I think I'm going to do 2.5%. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> um, so last illusion in whom there is no God. Um, fourth pillar of Islam. Fasting and self-control during the holy month of Ramadan. It's not much different from some Christians at least to observe Lent. Um, finally, a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in one's lifetime, if one is possible. Again, not terribly different from the Jews who desire to make a pilgrimage to Israel, specifically to Jerusalem. Now, have you ever heard Jews gather together, particularly around the Holy Days, and toast next year in Jerusalem? Um, so, those are the five pillars of Islam. Interesting. None of it seems so terribly frightening, does it? None of it seems so terribly evil. Um, Okay, so the first crusade. First crusade. Four armies. Four armies of crusaders were formed. Kind of broken up like this. We get different troops from different European regions. We have a kind of a, a French, a Gaulish contingent. We have a German contingent. We have a decidedly less organized band of common people, those uh, second-hand serfs I was talking about. Um, and and it's kind, of, it kind of interesting. So, I guess things change. The, the, the 
French, who we think was French today, were rather disciplined. Rather disciplined in their military movements. The Germans, however, sorry, folks. They were hell on wheels, and the wheel had barely even been invented yet. <laughs> they destroyed everything in their path. And they not. Like he put a sword in his hands, and, well, the uh, four armies of crusaders arrived in Constantinople. Here's the door from Europe. To Constantinople, remember that that's the original idea of going to say Constantinople are excommunicated brethren. Uh, Alexius, the emperor, says, okay, well, well here's how it's happen, guys. Since you're fighting for me now, you all have to swear an oath of allegiance. Any land that's taken, carefully, either from the infidel. Or, by the way, anything else that you just happen to conquer along the way, it belongs to me. Because I'm the emperor. And I'll parcel a lot for you guys, too. Um, very few people wanted to, very few people wanted to uh, read that. They just did not, they more or less did. And they wanted to fight. May 10, 97. Crusaders, added what army they could get from, from Byzantium. They attacked, um, it was then Nicaea, um, and a city surrendered. So, they're having to have some, they're beginning to have some success. Now, this goes on for quite a while. You can read the notes there if you want the particulars. I don't want to just rattle this stuff off, but uh, there it is on the notes, the exact particulars. What I want to suggest to you, though, is that at first, the first crusade was extremely successful. They took Jerusalem. They they occupied Jerusalem. Okay. You have all the wealth in one place. When you have all the wealth in one place and a significant portion of your army. Uh, he's, he's, he's not being paid. What are, what are those serfs? What are those serfs getting out of this, by the way? Are they regulars in the army getting paid? All they, all they get to do is leave home. All they get to do is go see the world. They can die somewhere else. Um, they, get, they probably get a few souvenirs, too. Maybe some food along the way. That'd be an army. But uh, honestly, when you got all the money in one place, it's really easy to find war. It, it, it really is. Um, man, you can go for it there. Um, so, they succeed with this. And, and they do what nations often do when they, when they win a war. They occupy. <coughs> Specifically, they occupy and they, uh, they, uh, they divide the territory into uh, four states, four so-called crusader, crusader states. Um, and, and, and that's uh, <coughs> that, that's okay for a while. What, what's, what's the problem? Students in history, what's the problem with occupation? A couple of things happen, right? A couple of possible things happen. Number one, occupation, especially if the occupied people don't like it very much, which is often the case, is very expensive. Okay, kind of funding, very, very expensive. You have to keep putting energy into it. Energy in terms of resources, energy in terms of lives, energy in terms of time. Energy has to keep going into this thing in order to maintain control. Another thing you mentioned is kind of interesting. Uh, sometimes what happens if you occupy long well enough, your troops go native. They, they start to assimilate. We usually think about conquered peoples being assimilated into. I mean, I, 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 I know I know a fellow who 
was actually, he wasn't military, he was a military contractor, spent a great deal of his career in the Middle East, working in the United States. Interesting enough, he absolutely loves Middle East culture now, back here. So what did he talk about? He loves the food, he loves the clothing. I don't say anyone native, but he certainly absorbed a lot of it. That's not to say bad, by the way. It's just kind of interesting. When you have an army that's charged with keeping the peace among people who are still essentially your enemies, if they start assimilating, well, I guess the best thing that happens is if they start assimilating, there's no more reason for a war. Interestingly enough, however, for the most part, for the most part, not only today, the cultural differences were just too great. And that's not to say there were no assimilations, but for the most part, the Muslim Islamic culture and the culture of the West were but a place. Despite the similarities I just pointed out in other religions, <coughs> language, skin color, the custom, all of those things. So the other alternatives you keep pouring the energy in. And uh, meanwhile, they're concentrating on Jerusalem. And there's something else that conquered people's like to do. The balloon was good. A lot of this. Better. Well, how can we be in control of these surrounding areas? In the meantime, the Muslim forces, the Muslim forces they force out, are regrouping. And, and all of a sudden, the tide turns. The tide turns, and the second crusade is a complete Disaster. Complete, unmitigated disaster. We're on page six. Um, and again, not my place to preach at you. This is we're talking about holy war. And we're talking about something which the church sanctioned. A real quick story, possibly serious, but the story of the Story is told of a, 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 a soldier. One of these low order knights returning from the crusade, and, and he, he, he recognizes that in war, sometimes happens. He had to do some things, but he just assumed rather not have done. Ever met anything like that? They talk about being over war, and they'll tell you they were at the war, but they don't want to talk about what they did. Maybe, maybe they'll talk about it with others with similar experiences. But, you know, they never talk about it without, you know, long or heavy like they either were tested. I think it was silly, but um, it wouldn't. Well, let's take off that. And he said, the father of sin. So the bishop says, well, okay, I can tell you how have you sinned. Well, of course, the crusades, I've stolen, I've raped. I've killed. I've killed other soldiers. I've also killed women. I've killed the elderly. I've killed children. And the bishop says to him, well, these people that you killed and heard and stole from, were they, were they Christians? Well, well, no, Father, they were, well, they wouldn't be a different term, but they were, they were Muslims. Oh, get them off the knees. That's no sin. In fact, they did great service to, to, to God by speeding them on their way to hell. You've got a Christian church that believes it's doing God's work. So, um, just to throw out a couple of things as you, as you contemplate that again, I don't know if I'm preaching here, but I'll just give you the verses. Uh, just kind of a couple of excerpts from 2 Samuel chapter 12. Uh, I'm just talking about something entirely different, but think it's out. Oh, I don't know. Uh, you killed the sword. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despise me. Now, that's obviously talking about something else entirely different, but 
the Gospel according to Matthew, the 26th chapter. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. For all who take hold of the sword will die with the sword. And finally, my personal favorite. This is something actually. John 18. Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. Um, just, we've kind of contemplated that for a while. I'll just leave it hanging there in space for you. Uh, the third to say, um, well, the third to say, I guess, if I had any problems, I need a school of an absent minded professor following all of this. I started writing my uh, notes on the Third Crusade. I said, you know what? The Third Crusade is a political nightmare. The Third Crusade is 19 pages worth of notes of, I don't know how to distill that this morning into, into a couple of sentences. So this is part one. Uh, part two, uh, uh, next week, I'll get into a little more of the political stuff behind this, and we'll deal with the Third and then this later world. So I'm going to write on the Fourth Crusade for now. Fourth Crusade, by the way, year 1202, 1204. Very powerful Pope. Innocent III. I always, I always love the names of those guys. <laughs> names like Pius. Innocent. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe like, I can do that. I, I mean, hi, I'm innocent. <laughs> so, Innocent the Third, wow. Innocent the Third, very, very powerful, but lots of, lots of power struggles, power struggles going on, and uh, Pope Innocent the Third really <coughs> plans to. Um, He's planning another, another crusade. The upshot of the third crusade, by the way, uh, was, was a truce. It was a truce. That, that basically, okay, you, you, can have, you can have Jerusalem back for a little while. But meanwhile, the truce is going on. Both sides of the planet are just half. I guess that's just how it is. So Pope Innocent III is planning a war while the truce is going on, but in the meantime, East and West, the Christendom, are still fighting each other. Um, it, 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 it's very, very long and complicated, so we'll get into some politics next week. Ultimately, the Fourth Crusade, the West winds up declaring war on Constantinople. And then really this is supposed to be about this is supposed to be about taking back Jerusalem from the so-called heathen, the so-called infidel. The time you get to the fourth crusade, you know the crusades, the next generation. They go ahead and say, well let's let's have a crusade against Byzantium. Remember the guys who wanted us to start this whole crusade business in the first place? So now we've got the West going into the East. Well, successfully, I might add. Um, so, what do I, what do I write here? Despite their oaths and the threat of exploitation, the Crusaders, those would be the people from the West, the Crusaders ruthlessly and systematically violated the cities, churches, and monasteries, destroying, defiling, or stealing everything they had in um, Only a relatively small number, probably about a tenth, by the way, a relatively small number of the crusaders actually reached the Holy Land. The rest of them were too busy pillaging and finding a market for what they pillaged back in Constantinople. And that, friends, was the last nail in the East-West fall. Um, so this gets back 
to uh, this type of pompous attorney, Pope Innocent, and uh, he's appalled, or so he says. And he writes the following in regard to the crusade that he started. The fourth crusade. He writes, As for those who are supposed to be seeking the ends of Jesus Christ, not their own ends, who made their swords, which they were supposed to use against the pagans, drip with Christian blood, they have spared neither religion nor age or sex. They have committed incest, adultery, and fornication before the eyes of men. They have exposed both matrons and virgins, even those dedicated to God, to the mountains, the sordid lusts of boys. Not satisfied with breaking open the imperial treasury and fluttering the good of princes and lesser men, they also laid their hands on the treasures of the churches, and what is more serious, on their very possessions. They have even ripped silver plates from the altars and have hacked them to pieces among themselves. They violated the holy places and have carried all across the relics. So that's Pope Innocent III speaking about the aftermath of the so called Fourth Crusade, you know, the one that he wanted to start. A very different perspective from uh, the writings of a government official in Constantinople who survived this melee, something uh, of a, I guess a, uh, a 13th century blogger, so to speak, writes this rather poetically and uh, tragically. He writes, O oh, city, the city idol, city's universal boast, supra mundane wonder, nurse of churches. Leaders of the faith, guide of orthodoxy, beloved topic of orations, the abode of every good thing. O city that has drunk the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury. O city consumed by fire. His impression of what took place there. Um, let me, uh, let me pause here for a moment and ask if you have any questions and comments. Ma'am? So, what is going on with the Jews at this time? Are they just trying to lay low from persecution? You know, I mean, this is mainly about the Muslims and the Christians, but at the same time, I'm sure that they're being persecuted. Well, um, back in the second crusade, I talked about. Uh, Around, yeah, well, back in the first two crusades, I talked about uh, we have the, the Frankish contingents and we have the German contingents. Well, Count Elric, uh, leading the German contingents, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, I guess I, I said it in a way that made it sound sort of funny, but actually it's anything but funny. They tended to destroy everything in the path, and, and particularly what they destroyed was anything Jewish. Roots of anti Semitism among the people. So, uh, what happened to the Jews, at least for the first two crusades, maybe the first in particular, was they were mowed down. They, they, they were mowed down. See, even if they wanted to, they wouldn't have been allowed to fight with a nominal Christian army. Um, they weren't quite seen as infidels, but they were obviously sworn. And uh, as current history tells us, Once a group of people get angry, once a group of people generate to that level of what I'll call mimetic violence. What's mimetic violence? Mimetic violence is a lynch mob. Mimetic violence is when one angry person comes up with an inflammatory speech, pretty soon everybody shaking their fists in the air saying, yes, to kill love, whatever. Uh, so, so, for the most part, the Jews, those who couldn't get in the way, were, were, were victims of this. What? The other point you say that the clergy in Constantinople and those areas, is their allegiance to Rome or their allegiance to No, the clergy, the, clergy, the clergy at this point, by, by the 13th century, by the beginning of the 13th century, the, the, the schism was just, just 
pretty well accomplished. So if you were a clergy person, if you were a priest living in, priest or non or bishop, any kind of any kind of clergy person living in the East, you're related to the Constantinople, and you would have likely been a victim. You would have likely been a victim, uh, especially for the Senate. Probably. Uh, probably. I, I, I don't want to. Uh, I'd like to think of myself as old and wise enough to not judge the you know, other man's heart, but um, unfortunately, you know, probably not that wise. But uh, the reason given, the reason given, remember I said these, these crusaders did this under the risk of excommunication. If you're a crusader, you think about it. You know, just, just like I suppose today, if, if you join the military, there's an oath of service, is it not? Okay. Well, uh, if, if you decide to become a crusader, you, you took an oath, you, you were doing God's will. And, and whereas they could really see that God's will might include slicing up the infidel, it definitely didn't include desecrated churches. So, um, so that's the reason given. However, my cynical nature says we very well might be right. But, uh, uh, yeah, Rome wanted all that wealth and maybe more than that they wanted control. Other questions? Do we know what the situation was in the Holy Land before the Crusades started? Um, the short. Jerusalem, the Middle East in general, that particular part of the world, the Gaza Strip area, then, to some extent, as now, it's left with its own devices, it's kind of a crossroads. It was a crossroads in Jesus' day. It has got Samaritans and Romans and Greeks, and it was a crossroads during this time, private crusades, and it was a crossroads, mostly it was left with its own devices. Now, Islam comes on the scene. This one comes on the scene, and very few religions, very few religions get started with wars. Right? Religions usually start out. A uh, prophet, some charismatic leader. So Islam begins, talking south center, and slowly but surely begins to gain adherence. Interestingly enough, it gains adherence among people who were pagans. It gains adherence to people who were among Christians who weren't all that happy with Christianity. It gained adherence among Jews who weren't all that happy with Judaism. And what's happening in the Holy Land is it's slowly becoming Muslim. It's slowly becoming Islamic. It's not that the Islam went in there with an army and said, okay, now we're taking over. It just kind of grew up. Pastor Meyer mentioned this in a sermon, I think it was uh, Sunday last. He said, What? 30 years from now, a typical Christian will not be a white person from the United States. A typical per- uh, Christian 30 years from now will be a person of color living what we think of today as a third world nation, whereas then only a relatively small portion of Christians will originate from the United States. Why? Because in the United States, Christianity is something of a touch, whereas in other parts of the world, it is growing. What will be much larger in the United States? A number of things. Uh, based on the current trajectory, Islam will be pretty huge in 30 years in the United States. Uh, some things that we now think of as so-called New Age religions, neo-paganism, will probably be much larger. 30 years from now. Uh, anyway, that's another course, but uh, question or sort of answer to. So it was relatively. It wasn't a war zone. It, it wasn't a war zone. There, there, were, there were minor conflicts. There was not a wholesale oh. Holocaust. Um, by, by the way, that's um, say, um, it is considered by some. Just to give you an idea, it's hard to imagine that this is so long ago. 
How would some modern historians consider that fourth crusade to be the Western world's greatest atrocity? Even greater in terms of numbers killed and horrors done to human beings with the Holocaust. And that's not to put the Holocaust down or to lessen its severity, but to suggest that this ancient event from 800 some odd years ago was an even greater atrocity taking place over the course of just a couple of years. Other questions? Okay, so we get into the um, last section, last section here. Um, and we'll talk about this in greater, we'll talk about this in greater depth. Um, uh, the remainder of the 15th century, a whole lot of things going on. And I mentioned at the onset that scholars tend to put the number of crusades all between seven and nine. And, and, and the reason for the danger is because they can't quite agree. They can't quite agree, um, on, especially the later ones, where one entered and the next one began. Considering that somehow multiple campaigns, and the time we got to the Fifth Crusade, which we'll talk about next week, as well as the Third Crusade and the subsequent Crusades, that I may not even follow an honor, you'll, you'll, you'll discover that. All, all of a sudden, this really, it's almost as if the Holy Land were an afterthought. People kept talking about it. But the reality is the fighting became more and more granular, more and more about mobile politics, more and more about mobile authority. And uh, that's, um, that's how it is. The other thing I'd like to point out to you before we, um, just a bizarre little video I'd like you to watch in conclusion, but, um, uh, Pope Innocent, Pope Innocent III, who, who made that, wrote that impassioned little piece. Do, do you have any idea what the next thing that Pope Innocent did was? He started the fifth crusade. Um, and, uh, I'm not doing a ton of a job of having my own opinions on this, but I'll play the video and really get this image for you. But, uh, um, Albert Einstein. I have to do it, of course. Uh, I'm no fan of Albert Einstein for a bunch of reasons. Uh, Albert Einstein is quoted to say, I really, I don't know, man, kind of contemplate what type of weapons would be utilized in the fighting of World War III. No idea what sort of things people will come up with. But I do have a pretty good idea what they'll use to fight World War IV. Rocks. <laughs> Sticks. <laughs> Leslie? Well, this is, and probably can't get into this here, and everybody else booting it down, but um, you know, I know it's very simplistic, but in light of even the news we had today about what's going on in Paris, you know, you wonder, the, Jesus, this is not about Jesus' teaching, of course, this is political, cultural, the crusades, basically, would you say? Um, I'll, I'll reference you back to the three scripture verses yeah. that, that, I, that, I, that I chose, and, and to make it personal... I would suggest that it is the height of arrogance and theological tomfoolery to attempt to teach people about the God of love at the point of the bayonet. I, I would also suggest that it is the height of hubris, human arrogance, to suggest that the God who created the most powerful galaxy Animals may need some kind of particle actually needs anyone to fight for it. Yeah. So I, I guess my, I just wish I could understand if the Quran was really, you know, could, can we indict the Quran on all this violence? Is it mainly cultural and political as well? Um, oh, okay. Uh, this is actually from my rejected notes. 
my, my wife being wise and I said, no, you can't say that, but I'll just indict Leslie and blame her on her for bringing this out. So I was, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about that thing. Uh, because you, can, you might be able to see where I'm going with this. A lot of us are afraid of the Muslim world. We're afraid of the Muslim world taking over. We're afraid of violence. We're afraid of jihad, which some people consider a sixth of a mysterious pillar of Islam. But the reality is, we didn't even say it. We were essentially jihadists. We were essentially the ones who said, hey, we, we have to fight for our God. As if God needed someone to fight for. Him. Well, religion, which by the way is something Jesus did not come to the world found, religion is essentially what you make of it, or at least this is my opinion. For example, uh, I, I read a former colleague who did a study on Islam in his church and suggested that Muslims are the evil children of Ishmael and it's up to us to stamp them out. Up to Christians. Up to Christians. I don't think of the nomination. Now, we can certainly read our Bible that way, I suppose. After all, Ishmael is the one that got sent away, is he not? You know, Ishmael is the son of the human intent. You know the story, and it's a little bit sorted. If there's anyone here under 18, just plug your ears, right? So, so Abraham and Sarah are waiting for a child, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and well past the natural possibilities for Sarah, at least. So Sarah, one night, maybe after a couple of cups of Mount of Shevet, says, You know, you know, Abraham, I, I've seen the way you look at my handmaid. I, 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 I know the way you, I, I, I know you like her. Come on, I get it. You like her. And Abraham is thinking, oh man, this is worse than the question about this distress with anything to do with fact. So, anyway, I'm being silly. But the reality is that they decide, actually, Sarah's idea is good enough. Well, maybe what God means is that you could have a child with. My hand in. And that was perfectly legal and fairly customary in those days. So that's exactly what happens. There's no problem with seeing a child there. And that's Ishmael. You have to wait some more, and eventually along comes Isaac. The child of promise, as Paul would say, the child not conceived by human intent or in an ordinary manner, according to God's promise. Now, as the children grow, friction. Ishmael and his mom get sent away out in the desert. But Abraham says, God, what about Ishmael? He's still my son. And God says, Don't you worry about Ishmael. You worry about Isaac. I'll worry about Ishmael. Out of him also, I will make great people. Now we can certainly use our scriptures, our Judeo scriptures, and view Islam, view Muslims as our lost brethren. Do we not? In much the same way as if we view the Quran properly, or what we think was properly, they might look at us. It's interesting. In the Quran, and if you've never read it, I suggest you do. Or at least read it before you speak with any authority about all things Islam. In the Quran, Jews and Christians are referred to as people of the book. People of the book. Suggesting that there's a commonality. Now, a Muslim could view their scriptures by saying, well, no, they're not the infidel. They're our lost brothers. And our ecumenical council could be not necessarily whether, whether or not the Catholics are going to perform the liturgy, but whether or not Christians and Muslims and Jews actually have something in common. I know that's not very Missouri, but hey, you got me started. Um, what I'm suggesting to you is that I could take the Bible and I could create a hideous religion of hate at it without trying very hard. 
They just as wanted to take the crown and to create something absolutely abysmal. Or we can seek, as we do in the scripture, to be led by the Spirit into the ways of the Prince of Peace. And, and I suspect, I suspect the same thing might be possible. Those parts of the Quran that are still touched by God's law, that are still touched by that original spark of divinity that even Paul cites, very well might be used to derive a philosophy of peace. Other questions? Okay, if not, let's close the word of prayer. Father, well, thank you for this time that you have allowed us more than sometimes to look back at our own history and this is uncomfortable. Where we recognize that corporately, as a group of people, we have sinned, fallen short of your glory. And there are times we could almost hear Jesus saying to the entire church, get behind me, Satan. And yet, we know that your hand in the time of the seasons, your hand is always needed. The Lord, the fullness of time, the fullness of time, your will is done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. So, Father, for your good, gracious, perfect will be given thanks. For the all availing sacrifice of Christ, we give you thanks. For the perfect example of Christ our Lord, our Savior, our Brother, and the ever present name of the Holy Spirit, we give you thanks. Lord, as we go from this place, through our separate lives, our separate ways, Father, the truth has been spoken, we ask that you may take root in our hearts and our minds, we ask that you might keep us safe, in the palm of your hand, and in the center of the will, and it is in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you both for your time attention. Next week, part two of the Crusades, uh, political stuff, and after that we move on to all things Reformation. <laughs>